Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO, The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Tara Mokalover, and let's continue with the focus and then get into some comments because last time we ended with Allies Abroad and then Dog in the West Auto completed, so. And this one discusses uh, basically the SS Stadt Niederlande. So here we go, and if I could grab the focus tree, that'd be great. Just like old times, or a page from Leopold's book. We're gonna go with a page from Leopold's book because I tried this off screen and it should be okay. Eichmann may have been the Fuhrer's comrade in the past, but times are different now. What once seemed like a shared history of nobility is now increasingly uncomfortable to think about, but now is not the time for thoughts of what might have been. This is the battle to win. Yisro and his laden with Himmler must pay the price. Nobody who shares in the Reichsfuhrer's treachery can be permitted to live. So, as what your comments have stated, I screwed up and should have focused more on the silos. Yes, I should have. And this is looking really, really bad for us. And yeah, I completely agree. But we still might have a chance. We still might have a chance, so I'm not giving out hope. Besides, if we lose, I might not show you this video, or we just fade in, fade out, and we'll go back to an earlier save that I have, in which we'll basically win. So, to be honest, I have tried this off screen, so I'm not <clears throat> opposed or not uncomfortable with what we might or might not be able to do. A page from Leopold's book, very good. And go ahead, march right on in, because, well... I don't think they have any manpower. I love that flag, though. That looks that looks really awesome. Even though I think that's a real flag. They have no manpower. They have 39 divisions. As you see, they're very weak. Someone did say that they really, really like their flag of the children of Spartacus. <clears throat> I think it's kind of cool. Not the most unique, but I think it's kind of cool. But regardless, as long as we get to the point where I can fight Himmler, and he's not easy, as you guys have pointed out in the comments. He's not easy. I think we can do okay. But let's go ahead and do Snake in the East. Mikhail Vetuska, a traitor both to his rifle masters and his own pernicious, per, pernicious race. Of all who collaborated to bring about the demise of Judeo-Bolshevism, he was among the most eager. However, we should not mistake his past groveling for servility. His seizure of Austin has demonstrated that he holds no regard for the correct order of things. Though we can never trust him, even the smallest of vipers can bear deadly venom. Better to have him, our hands around his separatine neck than Himmler's, or worse, no hands at all. Very good. So, I'm not too worried about this. If... Yeah, it's Preussen is just by itself, and they're going to get smacked down with our tanks and APCs and motorized. We got some special forces. Very good. And let's go ahead and grab this. More stuff to attack. Don't mind if we do. Uh, we are running out of political power here. Whatever. Here, whatever we can do, we'll do it. Let's see. This is Osterreich, which we do want to keep under us, but I will rush this one. This is much more important to get, because this has actual stockpile here, which is good. And very, very nice. Just in case, I'm going to put you guys right around Germania. And you never know, we could lose. <clears throat> I'm kind of trying to tease that right now. We could always lose. And which we might, very might, well, lose. But no matter, we'll still have a fun time with this. Because if we're not having a fun time with <laughs> screwing things up or trying to figure out the story in the end, well, that's not very cool. Yep, and he does. Someone did say that... Um, if he, if Himmler even gets one nuclear stockpile, then it's over for us. It might be. It might be. But we'll see what happens. Business as usual. Matusko was a man more than used to dealing in the dark. Building an empire of alleyways and basements was already his modus operandi. How fitting then was it for this king in the dark to gain prominence when all the Reich was under the black sun? Where there was a gap of authority, there was opportunity. And Vituska knew this all too well. It was clear to him that Hadrich did not rule Germany. It was also clear that Himmler did not rule, though this was somewhat more exclusive knowledge. This is good, of course, because come darkness or light, Belarus, or Belarus is a domain of Vituska. He is as eternal as a dirt, the stones, the hills, and trees. How fortunate it is for Vituska that the Reich is divided into squabbling, for he had no such weaknesses. <clears throat> Guns were being smuggled from anybody willing to sell them. Criminal organizations were bribed within and without the borders of Vituska's domain. A few individuals who possessed a threat were neutralized in various ways, or bodies sent to make sent to make a message. Industrial magnates were educated on how their lion's share of their production belonged to Vituska. Militias were armed, and existing militias were brought over to his side. Every man, woman, and child, animal, tree, bush, and blade of grass served him in some way, for Vituska's rule was supreme. A thorn rose grows under the black sun. <clears throat> a lighter touch... Our tin putt dictator, or stronger arm, and Vituska the Undying. Stronger arm. I like the factional opinion increase. It's not very much though. Hmm. And then Titan Grip. 
Alright, cool. I was gonna go with a lighter touch, though. Ventusco differs from most Eastern Brutes in that he possesses a vicious cunning, presumably to compensate for his lack of a backbone. He cares nothing for pride, only survival and advancement, despite traits or despicable traits, unworthy of the Reich's good graces, but they make him malleable. Vetusko knows that ultimately he cannot stave off German control forever. The Fuhrer will extend the hand of grace to the pretended kingdom and offer him promises of loosened reins, perhaps. A favorable but balance of power. He, does, he knows what's good for him, doesn't he? Cool. After that, we will go down this path. And if anyone needs to train, let's go ahead and do that. And I do have some coffee here that I've already sort of half drunk. But whatever. Whatever. Yeah, everyone's already trained. Good. As they should be. Hey, we need some anti-tank. So we need more of that stuff, too. Support equipment's looking okay. Yeah, let's go, and go down to five, then. A lighter touch. And then, morals mean nothing in warm. The only thing more despicable than a subhuman is a treasonous subhuman. Against all reason, the slaves of East Prussia have risen up and seized a portion of Germany's sacred lands. Jews, Poles, Russians, and a dozen other varieties of subhuman now control a key agricultural area along with the proud Aryan city of Königsberg. And yet, we hesitate. These barbarians are the most vicious enemies of the Germanic race imaginable. Brutalized by years of enslavement and extermination. Spado, that deluded fool, thinks they might comp contemplate entering into an agreement with us. Gosh darn you, Himmler, for what we must do. Ah, <sighs> big sadness for that one. We still get 2.2 every day. Beautiful. Do we need anything else here? Improve cast. Let me get some more cast. I love cast. Bombs, interceptors, stuff like that. Tactical bombers. Uh, we did use some attack helis early on, so... I'll grab some of that, because we can. Because where we're headed, we're going to have a little bit of fight ahead of us. There we go. There we go. Morals mean nothing in times of war. That is absolutely true. The middleman. The talk. Well, we'll see what happens. Is there anything else in the center focus tree that we can do that I've not done yet besides the one for the Spoticus children? No? Okay. A tin pot dictator first. Predictably, Matuska dances around the idea of an alliance. Turning aside direct overtures with false flattery while making a mockery of our diplomat still. He knows what's good for him, and that his free peoples cannot match our strength. Though cooperative is too strong a word to describe his attitude, he does have a vested interest in preventing Himmler's victory. He is unlikely to offer any direct military support, but may offer assistance if it will help to secure his personal rule of Auslan. At the very least, he won't be helping Himmler. Very good. And that's the most important thing. Yep. We gotta keep improving this one, if we can. Increases loyalty. Someone increases loyalty. Yeah, that one's the most important one. <clears throat> An unpleasant mediation. Spado was losing his grasp on reality, Hadrian thought. To find common cause with slaves, rebelling slaves at that, was he completely mad? The Führer had asked directly and been met with a only somewhat pitiful stare, followed by the assurance that it made sense from a pragmatic standpoint. As Hadrian stood across or by the window, staring out upon, out upon the ruined government offices across the way, he felt his teeth began to grind as a train of thought provoked by Spado refused to abate. Yes, he could see the logic, regardless of whether they were slaves or not. Anyone who wasn't a cripple could hold a gun, and soldiers were what he still needed. But slaves? <clears throat> How many could even be considered worthy of standing in his presence? Could a single drop of Aryan blood be found in their veins, even if each and every one of them was squeezed dry like an orange? They were almost all Slavs or Jews. The very thought was, but the Hoikachin had been authorized, hadn't it? There were Aryans in the East, living amongst the subhumans. That was unusual. How could that have even been the case? Their value had been proven, even if that buffoon Rosenberg hadn't given definitive evidence of... Hadrish shivered, and moved to stand near the heater. The Times... The lines dividing the hierarchy of races were clear-cut and insurmountable. It had to be. The theory of National Social Science proved that fact, but empirically, <clears throat> clenching his fists, Fuhr the Fuhrer returned to his desk and looked for something else to occupy his mind. Bless the mind, too small for doubt. Alright, so we have still one more here we can do, I believe. Unless it's balance of trust. Yeah, the, the natives really love us. And we have our eyes abroad, huh? Hmm... What can we do? Oh, we can just... We can't really do much here. No, that's okay. That's totally okay. Now, at least we got Vice back. Now it's one of our cores back under us. It was nice. 
Simple logic. For the greater good, for the greater good, for the greater good. Hadrish had been muttering the same four words for the half an hour as he worked. The repetition worked well for forcing change in one's mental processes. The so-called betrayal of his ideals was not incongruent with the necessities he would have to make the survival of the right possible. He set aside morality before. No one who had been there at Vansi to help set the final solution or motion would argue that it was acceptable by the standards of the population. It had always been about pure necessity, about freeing the right citizens from the burden of doing it themselves in the future when the full evil of international Jewry became too obvious to ignore any longer. This was no different. It was merely a sacrifice of conventional morality to assure the continued well-being of the Germanic race. If he could extract certain terms from the slaves, he could, they still could be of use while being removed from the question, just like the Madagascar plan. They didn't have to die, just cease to be a problem for Germany. Simple. There's no contradiction therein. So Hadrish told himself over and over and over again. He repeated it from dawn till dusk, till his very well-trained conscience finally fell silent. Then the next day he started all over again. The greater good. The greater good. The greater good. The greater good. I really hope these guys... Actually, you know, I'm not going to hope. These guys either will stay with us, or will we'll end up in nuclear hellfire. So, the olive branch and thorns. Hadrish knew that Batusco was not the kind to submit to him, being among the rare breed of men, a trait that Hadrish shared, who would not bend the knee to force. Still, there was remained disappointment when the envoy came back with the news of Vetusco's refusal to join the coalition. Who is better for Be Belarus? It is me. The soldier finished reciting the events that transpired in Belarus. Vetusco was not interested in bending a knee. The coalition still had a blank spot in the east, and this was a setback that must be worked around. Already working on trying to figure out what the next target for the coalition would be, Hadrish was interrupted when the soldier spoke up again. Batusko had another message. Outside of initial discussion, the soldier's face betrayed no emotion, showed no news of whether this was good or bad news, the way of a spotum. Go on, Hadrish stared with in interest. Batusko had absolutely no interest in joining the coalition. However, recognizing a common enemy in Himmler, he decided to spare some aid for the coalition to help us in the struggle. This was a good this was good news, and a smile almost appeared on Hadrish's face. A common enemy indeed. Batusko detested Hadrish, and always will, but even the self made king of Belarus would know that he would have nothing if Himmler had his way. This was all that Batusko would give, and it was enough for satisfaction. Batusko would get his just due at a later time. Aid is arrived from the east, so be it. And now, we should do not that one, because I do... Actually, you know what? I'm going to come over here. You guys recommend we shouldn't do this? But, honestly, money talks. There's really not much around here that we can do. Bringing home the garrison? Well, the Cornwall garrison's already dead. So, uh, Der Untermensch? The Forgotten Realm? You know, we're going to do Darren Dimitri first. There's no race in Europe so perfidious, barbaric, and belligerent as the Polish. Time and again, they've risen against the Germanic empires, bringing wreck and ruin to rightful German lands. They've been thrown in our side of every great power to ever rule their benign country, and will never learn their place no matter how many times we bring down the boot on their scrawny necks. Stubborn as mules, cunning as foxes, and brutish as apes, qualities that might, in some repulsive twists of fate, actually be useful to us. Cool. And just in case, Hadrish, or Hadrish, Himmler's not going to fight us yet, so we're good. just going to do that. All right, balance of trust. Nothing down there because I haven't done anything else. Uh, let's see. We're currently currently influencing these guys. Osterreich is pretty high. Yeah, this one's much more important to do though. And let's get more factionalism first. It doesn't matter. Oh, hello. I was not expecting that. They're going to war with the children of Spartacus, eh? Maybe that was a Himmler focus. Interesting. Barbie, man, you're getting really bald. An easy boulder. Jan sipped his coffee as he watched his counterpart take, make, make his way towards his post. His rifle loosely strapped around his back in contrast to the German on the other side of the border. He'd been there early in the morning when Jan was still stretching and struggling with his old jacket, and he was still there now, two hours later. Jan wasn't sure the man had moved in all that time. His eyes silently... His eyes silent sentries on her silent robe. Wasn't like much of anything across the border, anyways. Good morning, Andrej said quietly, and Jan turned back to his accomplice. Anything to report? Nothing. I've been watching the German over there. Don't think he's moved a muscle in the last hour. Jan replied, taking another sip of his coffee. Andre <clears throat> looked over to the man and then back. He's an SS man, isn't he? They're, they all are. Creepy dudes. Andre replied, a hint of disgust poking through some. Jan agreed, as did just about every Pole alive would, too. They had very, very, very good few experiences with Germany in general, but let alone the SS. Yeah, well, as long as they stay there, we don't have a problem with them, at least. Nothing we can do about it, Jan replied. Andre stood and nodded it back across, and marched back across the road, and Jan's eyes turned his back towards the German. For a moment, he could have sworn the man was watching them before his eyes flicked back down the road. A strange beast, indeed. Reassert our influence. The Poles have had their backs to the wall. Their nation is doomed, and they know it. <clears throat> the moment any significant force is brought to bear on the resurgent state, they will crumple like sheet metal under a panzer's treads. If there's any wise men among the seething millions of po Polish in the general government, they will advocate for the immediate surrender and subservience to the Fuhrer. The Poles will bend, or they will break. No alternative is possible. And we're going to do this with relatively low manpower. Stanislaw must be ours. 
So, after this code breaking, why not? Very, very, very good. My apologies about that, but my cat was meowing outside my door. Can't keep Binky waiting, right? The balance of trust. Yeah, the natives really like us. Which is fine with me. Whatever. Reset our influence. Poland lost again. Ah, they have to be in a general faction with us. Alright. And we've gone to war with them. Now, I don't want to do the middleman stuff. The military stuff we got to do a little bit more with right now, so keep the military stated. The Wehrmacht's short-term demands generally trend towards the practical. Their distrust can be alleviated to a considerable degree by showing that we will not empower the SS at their expense. To this end, we should make sure that their material needs are met and avoid the appearances of SS favoritism. Maintaining the military's loyalty in this way will require substantial industrial investment to meet their demands. However, it will more than pay off if they are able to bring those guns to bear on Burgundy. Anything else? Let's see, we can invest, you know, we'll invest a little bit more. At this point, it really doesn't matter about civilian spending, but I'm going to spend more just because we get more political power that way. So, it's pretty good. Alright, if we act fast enough, it, this won't go too badly for us, so. Get enough uh, planes in the air and we'll do okay. There we go, cut these guys off. Good. Actually, what are the strength? 57, we only 57, they've lost than 20 now, which is good. Not too bad, actually, and we've lost less than 1,000, which is awesome. They've lost 77, 76,000 so far. Okay, I don't, all right, they're gone. Told you, easy. Keep the military station, seated. Aside from the hatred of the SS, what keeps the military on our side is the promise that we can fulfill the vision preached by Goring, the restoration of the Reich's previous glory and grandeur. Needless to say, that will not be possible at this time, but they don't need to know that. The Wehrmacht has always been easily led. Mayor promises of glory are generally enough to sate their discontent. But if these prove insufficient, there are alternate solutions, usually involving pomp, ceremony, and massive recruitment drives. Ah, the general government is back, my friends. And actually, we shall return these guys over here. Pretty good. Oh, what is this? Meet with the military leaders. Increase their opinion a little bit more. The 39, they have negative factional experiences. Uh, it looks like that one's actually going down, which is not good. Let's do that one. And... Yep, yeah, that's it. Hello, General Government. Inter... Intermatregierung. So be it. So be it. The fall of Warsaw. Volchik Omla lay beneath the rubble, dreaming of the oblivion. He drifted across a reality where it all ended, where his brethren would never fear to speak Polish, where Warsaw would reside beneath a peaceful horizon, never starless, and the shrouded horrors of the past long forgotten. A world wrought from his own sacrifice, for him to join a doomed uprising would ensure that Nazism to be lost in echoes and for his children to be dis disintegrated into the ashes of destiny and time. He awakened from the call of his son, scarcely a decade old, holding his morbidly wounded arm, the child begging for him to find the strength to lift himself up from the debris to join his wife and survive the mortar strike. The father struggled to turn his head to see the devastation. He saw his comrades from the underground all around him, their bodies gray and still. From his numbness, he knew that he would join them soon in the end. He extended his arm and pulled his son close, told him that with his dying breath to walk towards the sunrise until they reached their mythical new homeland, a place where they would not be lost again. The child's grip did not falter the pain of a lost too providential in his hands. The boy prayed to God to deliver them from evil for a world where they would never have to suffer. <clears throat> As his son begged for the Lord's mercy, he remembered the, his vision that he saw, and then he decided that nothing could have ever made him give up his only son. Weakly, he murmured his last words, If I were God, Jacob, I would, or Jacob, I'd make the world just so, and no difference. So I have you, I have you. His voice drifted away from the world with his soul. The child held his cold, motionless hand until the smoke cleared, and the toiling of St. Florian's bells rang across the ruin. Jacob Omila, Omila reached into his father's uniform, unpinned the emblem of the Kotvika, from his leather jacket and placed it in his pocket before he turned away, away from the sunset, and began to make his way along the, the long road home. Never, ever lost. Oh boy. Oof. Remembering the glory days. Only brass tacks left. Unfortunately, the militaries remain as short-sighted and recalcitrant as ever. Every, every slightly, every every slight, every insult and grudge influences their conduct towards the SS. Given that the Fuhrer himself is of the SS, this selfish factionalism is unacceptable. If the situation turns against us, there will be no more glorious conquests or indulgent parades. Himmler will kill us all and burn the world to ash. If any men of the Wehrmacht survive, it will be as withered, starving animals, ecking out 
or eking out a miserable existence among the torch ruins of our cities. This reality must be made exceedingly clear to our stubborn allies. Alright, Osterreich is great and all, but this one is definitely what we need first. Very good. Wow. When I try this off screen, this didn't happen. But, you know, whatever. Only brass stacks left. Shpado paced across the room one last time, then abruptly stopped. He turned and looked at the gathered men. Hardliners, moderates, everyone from ex-members of the Shona's clique to the moderates of Spiel had assembled. A diverse crowd, one united in common purpose to put a stop to the madness that had gripped the Reich. Gentlemen, the traitor died in an instant. He had, complete, he had complete control of the room and their absolute attention. You know why we're all here. It's comrades, I'll keep this brief. The Reich is sick, and that's plain enough for us to see. But worse than that, our existence as we know it is as grim as it is... And it is, yeah, it is at risk. Shpado quickly scanned the room. More than a few heads were nodding their assent. Soon enough, the Reich, the Fuhrer, me, we're all going to call upon you men. And you know all well, this call to arms will be life or death. There will be no room for error because if we were to lose, the world as we know it will end. For us, it's either victory or death. Now listen well. Next up. We shall come back over here and do pull them loss again. More than 20 years ago have passed since we last crushed the Poles underfoot, but little has changed. The Pole is as ever a stubborn but feeble enemy. Without the moralizing of certain Hayad generals, there was no need to show such restraint this time around. The home army is scattered or dead, allowing us to bring our full manpower to bear against more worthy foes. The general government can now be restored under the auspices of Hadrich's chosen man, rather than some buffoon from the NSDAP. Never again will the mules of the East rise against the master race. Very good. And we lose Clum, though. We lose Clum. Because he becomes the leader of the general government. Mm, I would like to reintegrate them, but there's not much we can do about that right now. Mm, so be it. <clears throat> Italy joins OFN. Well, we got bigger things to think about than some Italy joining the OFN. Oh, we can reintegrate Spartacus eventually, but probably not. <laughs> Their loyalty is very, very low. Wow. Poland lost again. Cool. Is there anything else we could do here? Meet with the militarists. Well, we could try that. 50, that's quite a bit. Do you, oh, yeah, I don't want to do that one. We'll do that one. Cool. So there's those guys. The middleman. I do not want to decrease the militarist faction right now, though. No, 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 no. Money talks. The Bretons, in all their dudery and greed, remain as useful as ever. In times of treachery such as these, perhaps unscrupulous men are just what we need, especially if they come bearing arms aplenty. Knowing Brittany, they will also be selling to Himmler and anyone else on the right willing to pay. They will pay for the double dealings later, but for now, we must play the game and indulge their avarice. Very good. Very, very good. Now, if these guys win. Well, whatever. I don't really care. If anything, actually, that just makes them even weaker because they have more resistance to deal with. So, they have no manpower. They have one to three divisions. Easy pickings for later on. What do we have down here? Encourage intelligence. You know, we haven't done these guys for a while, so we'll do that one. That'll be good. When he talks, the market is open. Perhaps it's for the best that the Breton SS not be seized the apparatus, apparatus of state. To lose access to the black market will be highly detrimental to our cause. The flow of arms will continue for the time being, so long as Himmler does not bring his forces to bear on the mercantile state. In fact, the threat of such might be exactly what we need to force the Bretons to pick a side. Neutrality only works so long as it is respected by everyone else, and neither the Fuhrer nor, Hay nor uh, Himmler do so. So we'll see what happens. What do we have here? Purchase infantry equipment. Uh, that costs political power. That costs stuff. Support equipment. We're actually doing okay on a lot of stuff here. And before I forget, have you guys to pause for now. <clears throat> this part of Germany is going to be super important to keep under us. So now the default is at 8, which is fine. The market is open. Increase the loyalty to Hadrish. A useful circumstance has risen as a result of swaying certain Himmlerites to the fierce side. Burgundian invasion plans are now in our possession, specifically ones pertaining to a number of peninsular state on the western border. The regime in Brittany would doubtless to be most intrigued by these verbally genuine documents, not to mention utterly infuriated, considering the Himmlerite leanings of their SS. It would be very unfortunate for Himmler if someone were to pass the invasion plans along and thereby drive the Bretons into the Führer's camp. Good. Mm, this all costs stuff. I don't mind spending money, though. Small boost to GDP? Well, I don't think that really matters too much for us, but hey, we'll do it anyways. Nice, we're getting closer and closer for this one, which is very, very good. <clears throat> Once, like, all the warlords have taken aside, then we, I think we, if I remember correctly, we ended up trying to beat each other up, which is fine with me. 
I'm going to do that. Why not? <clears throat> Why not? All right. Reintegrate. Reveal his treachery. The Forgotten Realm. Calcasin, why not? Josiah Zu Valdak Piermont. A troubled man, to say the least, once I devoted him a right. He was recently spurned by the Rexfira and abandoned that cause. Furthermore, it is in the chaos of the Burger Krieg. Rex Commissary Calcasin has been become the de facto independent. If he's no friend of Himmler, then he's still German, and he's still German, then he's a friend of ours. Josiah's long reign is well deserved, and his resources will be critical to defending the arch traitor. Very good. Let's see. Pumot anti Burgundy propaganda. 87.7. Hmm, that is 25. So be it. We'll do that. <clears throat> Empower Wehrmacht Commanders. That is a cost that uh, is too great to bear for what we really need. Well, it looks like Russia is doing pretty well. The Kazakh Khanate, I think we saw it in the last episode, it does exist, so. The Forgotten Realm. After that, uh, promises of wealth. More wealth than you could dream of. Ooh, what do we have here? Which was a new one? Encourage military intelligence. Yeah, might as well keep doing that one. That's fine. The madman of Caucasin. Caucasin. Hadrian strummed his fingers impatiently against the desk. Exactly twenty stood. Twenty silent seconds had passed since the personal secretary of Ex Commissar Josias Epaprens Zu Valdek on Permont had answered the call. Hadrian's left leg was jumping in rhythm to the ticking clock. How long it had it been nervously vibrating? He grabbed it with his free hand and cursed himself. He was not a weak man. He was not a weak man. No. Hey, Hadrian. Hadrian. A gruff voice shouted down the phone. Hadrian jumped, pushing his hair back into place with a scowl. I am grateful that you contacted me, contacted me, my fear. I will not forget this act of respect. All Rex Commissars deserve respect, Hadrian replied tactfully. You have served the Reich dutifully, despite tensions that have arisen. Loyalty deserves to be re rewarded. I am not the source of those tensions. The fury embedded in the Rex Commissarius' voice was palpable. Hadrian's start skipped a beat. He smiled with cold satisfaction and gripped the receiver t tightly. Ah, as Führer, I seek to suppress all sources of tension. Hadrian waited for a response. Silence, no one is above me. The Führer Prince is absolute, yet there is those who would claim... Heinrich must be crushed, Josias barked, barked back in agreement. His voice was dripping with spite. That chinless worm is a traitor to the Aryan race. Have you gazed upon that, his mongoloid features, might fear? A man with that much power is a threat to national socialism itself. Hadrian's Hedrus, eyes widened in shock. His smile spread further, opening it like a knife wound across his narrow face. An ally in the land of fog. Very good. Very good. Promises of power. His own little kingdom. Promises of wealth. More than you could ever dream of. Promises of power. Rex Commissar of Calcissia is a fine posting, but is that truly where Josias would like to end his career? There are many other rungs he has yet to reach on the ladder of power ahead of the Oppo. Maybe the SD, perhaps even a place in the Fierce Cabinet? Surely he would like to go further. Every office will need feeling someday. Hmm. Oh, Promises of Power, and then his own little kingdom. Calcissia. Calcissia. It's truly a success story in the history of National Socialist co colonialism. Thanks to Josias' constant vigil and tireless administrative efforts, it has become the oil field and oil mine of the entire Reich without Caucasus. Caucasia. Without Josias, some might even say the Reich would not be what it is today. It is only fitting, therefore, that regardless of future career advancements, Josias should be permitted to retain control or command of Caucasia. A little kingdom of sorts all to his own, not that he would ever suspect him of royal ambitions. Very good. So we got this stuff done. Uh, we uh, we should mm, we have secure control of the Greeks Marine. Well, not really. Under new management. Hmm. A place in the Reich, holding it against the inevitable. Well, we could do that, but hmm. New options influence idealist faction members. Well, I really don't want to lower native and moderate faction support. Keep our SS strong. Rewards. Eh. Keep the intermesh quiet. Meh, that's not really interesting. <clears throat> oh, place in the Reich. Despite his weaknesses, Feldmeier is still a man of the SS with substantial forces at his command. Given the disunited states of the Reich, we might struggle to force his capitulation before Himmler does. Given these facts and his records of loyalty, the Fuhrer has decided to offer an open hand before trying the closed fist. Feldmeier should be easy to sway. Himmler's disregard for collaborators is obvious to all at this point, so it should be a simple matter of providing him with guarantees of safety. His beliefs will do the rest. Also, it's weird, it's weird seeing Meyer. Uh, if you don't know, Meyer's a superstore in the Midwest of, of the United States of America, so... <clears throat> Feldmeier. Hmm. As expected, Feldmeier understands his position well. He possesses no threats to us and is quite receptive to the Führer's overtones. Or overtures. There is no indication that he plans to side with Himmler. Once it is certain that order has been restored in the Netherlands, 
and forces will move in to reinforce the borders and keep Himmler's forces at bay. Undercover other formal integration of the Netherlands into the Reich proper. We're going blazing through these right now. Bring the garrison home. The Cornwall garrison is a rightfully vaunted element of the Wehrmacht. They have been watchful eyes and stalwart guardians alike, doing their duty to keep the British Isles secure. The commander, Franz Hadler, is not an SS man, but would certainly trust Heydrich over Himmler any day. We must ascertain the garrison's situation and bring them home if possible. Their high standard of training and discipline will match even the best of Himmler's minions. Very good. Very, very good. Good. Let's see, only eight left. Oh, the Aryan Brotherhood is gone. Oh, that's so sad. So sad. Imagine if they had actually won and we could ally them. That'd be kind of wild. Absolutely wild. Alright, let's grab... It's quite a bit ahead of time for that one. How about trucks? Still quite a bit ahead of time. Actually, let's grab this one. Why not? Bring home the garrison. Oh, never mind. We got some artillery to do. That's a little bit ahead of time as well. Nothing here really interests me. We're done with our land doctrine. Armor. How about some of this stuff? Scout helicopters. We're probably not even going to use those, but whatever. Uh, what's next? Helicopter stuff. What's cool and all. That's a little bit ahead of time. Heavy aircraft. Not even really going to use it, but do this one because you can. Cool. Uh, my fear, in spite of the General Oba's Hodler's best efforts, the Cornwall garrison was defeated by the English forces. At present, its personnel have been entered pending negotiations between us and the English. While Hodler's troops were disarmed, they remain experienced combat veterans, which could prove very useful in the upcoming struggle over Germany's future. Therefore, it is recommendable to see whether it is possible to return the men to Germany. Hail Heydrich. Picking up the remnants. In disappointing turn of events, Hadler and his uh, forces have been overthrown by the English. Not unexpected considering their isolation, but a poor showing indeed. Still soldiers are soldiers, and the situation cannot be blamed solely on Hadler's inconsistency. The English are a moralistic people despite their perfici perfidy. Most of the garrison is still likely alive, confined to POW camps. With England in a precarious state, they would not object to losing a few thousand hungry mouths. Well, we'll see. 93, we're getting close. We're getting very close to getting these guys under us. Yeah, these guys are completely lost. Osterreich? Well, they're 69, which is not bad. What can we do? Mm, purchase stuff. Meet with military leaders. We could do that. They like us 47. That's actually not too bad. Actually, this has been doing a lot better. The weakest one is the moderates, which isn't bad at all for us. So. Gott strafe England. Reinhard Heydrich fumed at the site of the short letter. Its recognizable head marked foreign office stood out as an affront to the Aryan race, and its contents reassured Heydrich that the fear, Reich's fear to destroy England would forever be a stain on its glorious history. What is it, mein Fuhrer? Must we pay for the transport costs? Otto Gila eyed Heydrich with some apprehension. No. They say they're going to use our men as laborers to stave off the winter storms. Can you believe that? That a race we defeated in combat so often would dare insult us in this way? Heydrich itched for a cigarette, but he'd have to wait until he was alone. Such unspottedness behavior could not be publicly practiced. We aren't getting Heydrich's troops back. They will be punished one day. So we can't even do that. So that sucks. So we are actually we already did all these. Nice. I'm not doing that one yet just because I can't afford to lower the, the stuff down there. But the native support, who cares? The core of Hadrian's support base will always be the Deutsche SS, not the Burgundians. While the latter must be constantly appeased, a former have always looked up to our new Fuhrer as a paragon of National Socialism. Retaining the faithful sons of Germany in our coalition will not be complicated. They are typically content to receive the same rewards as they always have been, albeit in ever greater quantities. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the spontaneous attitude has not been correctly inculcated in the Deutsche SS yet. Very good. I just need Silesia. That's all we really need. And more political power. But mostly just Silesia. 93.375, very good, very good. We need one more, and we've got to save up political power at this point, so. We could do this. I want Osterreich. It's still 69, so that's not bad, but we just got to wait for another one. Keep our SS strong. Rewards for loyalists. Men of the Burgundian SS live a thankless, thankless existence. Utterly brainwashed into servility by him, though. They kept nothing for riches. While an austere life is the iron way, the circumstances of our time have pre uh, depre depreciated... Uh, that lasts out in Germany proper. The failings of the Deutsche SS will be remediated or re remediated in time, but for now they must see that service is worthwhile. Whether they demand arms, supplies, loot, or cold, hard Reich's mops, the price must be paid for the sake of our strength. My, my apologies. My pronunciation in this campaign has been just not very good. Just straight up not very good at all. I apologize. 
we saw right there, we could have been able to reintegrate them, but we don't have enough PP. At this point, I'm done doing focus. We, we got to get more political power, so. And as long as we have one more nuke than them, I'm pretty sure we'll do okay. They have 44%. That's what I kind of figured. Yeah, they got that nuke up there, whatever. I don't care. Alright, so let's go ahead and do this one. Let's get closer to more political power first. So, give it a few seconds. Oh, and they've been defeated. Whatever, I don't really care. Talk, bypass, whatever. If you'd like to read about that one, you can go right ahead and do so. As well as the middleman. So be it. Alright, let's go ahead and increase relations. Uh, right there. And we need 50 political power, which is not good. We're at 97 out of 95. And hopefully we can just straight up annex them, which is probably the most important thing to do. Still 97. Still 97. Very good. Also, Reich is 69, so and this is still 0 cell. So pretty much everything's been decided already. Now, the last thing to do is have a little bit of a conflict between us and hopefully Himmler. <clears throat> hopefully things don't change. Because that wouldn't be very good for us. Oh, and see, we did lose a guy to general government. There we go. Boom. All right, we can keep doing this if we want to. Expand inner circle. Why not? The inner circle generally refers to those aware of Himmler's plan for atomic annihilation. While it would not be accurate or inaccurate to say that violence is inherent to the national socialist order, with good reason, of course, the Reich's fierce vision is far too far for most. If we fear complacency, it may do us some good to allow more of our allies to become aware of the nuclear plan. Most simply, we believe we are fighting a war against a usurper. If the true nature of this conflict is revealed, it might permanently galvanize them against Himmler. Very good. Alright, so we can't do that. So we're pretty much done with everything except the left side of the focus tree. So, hey, whatever. Keep the moderates assuaged. If we bring Spayats and Balmanites into our coalition, they are unlikely to cause too much trouble. Nevertheless, they might influence each other in unduly problematic ways, like a flock of chickens panicking at the first sign of danger. The chains binding us must be strengthened to address the weak link. Predictably, the most foremost concern of moderates is the civilian population. They fail to see the critical importance of our military matters or the political struggle to facing us. Still, if it must be done to calm their soft hearts, then we can still make some small concessions. So be it. All that mattered was that we got these guys under us. That's all that mattered, in my opinion. I mean, this is pretty dangerous. Five versus four. That is pretty gosh darn scary, but... Pretty much, at this point, like, the battle lines have already been drawn, so... Whatever. Keep the moderates. Switch. And we've integrated them. Easing their fears. The moderates appear to believe that the Fuhrer is planning to do away with them once Himmler is defeated. This belief is correct! But it does not serve us for serve us for them to continue holding it. We must ply their strength with a gentle hand so that they may come to perceive only benevolence and endorsement of normality in the fear's actions and words. Obviously, it won't be true, but who will question our narrative when we can claim to have saved the entire world from destruction? Of course. Uh, absolutely. Motor divisions? Uh, I don't even care about these extra motorized divisions, whatever. That means nothing to me, really. Class? They should be led by John Williams. Well, that doesn't sound very... Germanic? Eric Naumann sounds more Germanic than John Williams. You mean like Johann? Willems? Wilhelms? There you go. Easing their fears? Temporary amnesty. It will not do to have any inconvenience if legitimate fear is growing amongst the moderates. We need them to have full confidence in a regime. That cannot be accomplished solely through empty promises or, or by us or by disappearing anyone who becomes a problem for us. Offering formal amnesties of prominent moderates will show our good intentions to the public. That way, they might be convinced that our opinion matters and that provide further support to the regime. Those who are too dedicated to the moderate cause can also be marked out for after our victory, for when we shall finally deal with them appropriately, of course. Alright, Osterreich must continue to remain under our <clears throat> rule. Or influence, we should really say. Reintegrate. That's cool that we can actually reintegrate Brittany. That actually is really awesome. But there's nothing we can really do about that, so. It is now November 1966. War will probably be soon upon us. Uh, let's make sure we do this, too. Where we're going, money's not going to be needed. What's done is done. You, dude, you, you'll listen to me, and what you'll do is what you're told. Hey, just slammed the phone under the receiver. He was tired, sick and tired, before this entire mess. His subordinates did his bidding without question. Kidnapping, extermination, torture, extortion. The task didn't matter. But those days are long gone. Hager saw it. Unfortunately, killing his allies was out of the option. Or options. Things were different now, and if he didn't show some goodwill, the fragile lines would collapse, and if that happened, a chill ran down his spine. Gone. 
Everything would be gone. His sacrifices would be for nuts. Still, it was incredible and a touch ironic that he had to appeal to a moderate him, an SS man. What was the world coming to? Hedrus let out a small chuckle. What a bizarre reality he faced. It was a far cry from the days when he could have men like Bloch shoot shot on a whim. <clears throat> Seems almost like a lifetime ago. Keep the intermesh quiet. Hold the Himmlerites' loyalty. Keeping Himmler Himmler's favorites on her side will require endless dedication. Their loyalty to the Hadrish is predicated on a view or viewing his vision as more valid than that of the Reich's fears. If they have reason enough to doubt us or are adequately tempted by Himmler's promise of a place in the bunkers, they will be surely abandoning us without hesitation. Thankfully, Himmlerites lack the cold rep reptilian mind of their namesake. They are creatures of emotion, defined by the ebb and flow of racial pride and hatred for the enemy that makes them pliable, if nothing else. We have a lot of options here. Purchase equipment. We got stuff we can do up there. Cool. Yeah, the 78. So Himmler can't do anything for these guys. So that's good. And like I said, the battle lines have been drawn. We've integrated Silesia. Awesome. And my goal early on is to cut these guys down here. So expose Himmler's treachery. Himmlerites are accustomed to following orders, not acting autonomously. When the sources of their guidance is cast into doubt, confusion and uncertainty reigns in the role. By this means, we can permanently save our server their ties to Burgundy. We possess much knowledge that Himmler would prefer to keep secret along with a city stream of new information from defectors with that. In a few well-placed lives, we can string along the Himmlerites like fish chasing bait. Mudslinging, the pharaoh rubbed his eyes as he rested in his chair. His eyes worn from strain before him, illuminated by a desk lamp. <clears throat> Uh, set yet, yet another das, uh, stack of dusty communiques, keys, communiques, and letters plucked from deep in the Reich's archives. Himmler's name adorned each and every one, messages from years past, mostly detailing the most mundane operations of life. Hadris let out a sigh to press onwards, shuffling through the stack, suddenly pausing as he read the title of one particularly yellow note dating back to 43. Escape landed red, and Hadris realized he had, he had struck gold. He skimmed through it, and his greatest hopes were confirmed at some point in 1943, at the height of the war. Himmler had made a contingency plan to surrender to the Allies had things gone south. A written manifesto of treason, Hadrich set the paper down gingerly as if, as if scared it would disintegrate if moved too quickly. He said under breath he barely even realized he was holding. It wouldn't be as late of a night as he feared. I got you now, you old dude. Keeping the intermesh quiet. Non Aryans should rightfully have no place in a coalition, but desperate times call for desperate measures, but while where many Aryans have failed. To heed our righteous call to arms, the lesser peoples of Europe have taken their place. Concerning but any reservations, we have our secondary to defeating Himmler. Keeping these degenerates satisfied is unlikely to be difficult. The needs of the subhuman are simple, defending his brutish nature. We doubt they have any surprise for us. So the war should happen soon. Just saying, it should happen soon. Transfer over. Transfer out slaves. A fear once said, Germany has grown soft and fat on the backs of its slaves. We must again learn to stand. Proud and strong on our own two feet. This remains true even now. Despite our desperate need for labor, the slaves continue to cause us trouble. The SS only has so many bullets, and ideally those should be reserved for the Burgundians. Our lesser allies have expressed an interest in the repatriation of our slaves. We loathe, or we are loath to surrender them to anyone rather than just dispose of them entirely, but it would be a most expedient solution to our problem. So be it. Unforeseen benefits, eh? Russo finish ceasefire agreed. Very good. Ninety-three point five, which actually sounds like a radio station. Unforeseen benefits. Hadrish, his desk grown quietly under the stacks of paper that rested upon its surface. They were papers typical of any head of state: military reports, budgetary concerns, economic struggles. One stack, however, was a very very typical of any fear, and certainly of an SS man like Hadrish. A series of reports, diplomatic messages, and analyses of the new relations of slaves and poles. It had not been something Hadrish had ever planned on doing. Heck. If he had it in his way, he would have ground their skulls into the dust long ago, but even with his personal distaste for the Untermensch, he had to admit a few things about the change that uh, had surprised with him how useful they were. Chief among these surprises was the issue of repatriation of slaves, or as Hadrius liked to put it, deportation of Slavs and other indesirables back to the country. It startled him how simple the solution was, how it worked out for everyone involved. The Slavs were placated with the return of their family and friends, and with every Slav that crossed the border east, the Aryan paradise in Germany that Hadrius envisioned grew closer and closer to reality. After all, Germany was for Germans, was it not? As it may have not been the solution that he truly wanted, reporting the Slavs was simply kicking the issue of racial impurity down the road, but he had to admit it was a quick fix. Perhaps these poles could be of use. Some use, after all. Who would have thought of this? Who would have thought? <clears throat> so now we're pretty much done with the focus tree. Cool. And it's almost 1967. Now we just need more political power, and we can reintegrate Osterreich. Which, when I tried this off-screen, I, I wasn't even able to integrate them, so... 
Ooh, now it's a little low. Huh. So let's see what happens. Aerial refueling. At this point, it doesn't matter. Just let time go on. We're, we're going to grab this if we can. It's going to be a little bit more than a year, but I don't really care. Nice. And obviously, we can't do anything with these guys. Zero out of 95. So, whatever. <clears throat> Reagan's bug is still down here. Oh, wait. We, didn't, we never integrated these guys, huh? But hey, we at least maybe get their soldiers. Can we get military access through here? Maybe, maybe not. No. Well, they'll die a death down there then. So be it. Hangman's Gambit. With trembling hands, Razor's placed a final pin representing the nuclear arsenals in his unmarked territory. In his marked territory, I should say. The reports were accurate. He'd done it. Until Himmler came for them, the majority of the nukes were out of his clutches. They wouldn't have enough time to launch an effective strike. Even so, Hadrich couldn't bring himself to a smile. It wasn't over. The moment Himmler felt his arsenal was large enough, he would launch it. He had to be denied that chance, but how? Military confrontation had always been inevitable, but also seemed far away in the future. Now that it was impending, Hadrich found himself worrying about the readiness of his forces. Did he have enough what was needed to match Burgundy? Himmler commanded one of the largest and most well-equipped forces in the world. If the Reich could not stand against him... Nope, it was too late for doubts. Hadrish might have been able to sleep without the threat of nuclear Armageddon, but the security of the future would be uncertain until the Reichswehr was dead and his forces scattered. It was now or never. It would be the hardest battle the Reich would ever fight, but it had to be done. If we wait any longer, we are going to get blown up. I've even not even made any soldiers because of costs and such like that. But you know what? Screw it. I'm ready. How about you? Three more months? If we wait any longer, they're going to be able to build up more forces. We're going to go to war right now. I didn't even, I don't think I've even integrated this up. No. That doesn't really look like a lot of guys. He's got up to 149 divisions, which is kind of extreme. But whatever. Eyes abroad. You know what? At this point, let's go ahead and buy some stuff. We'll buy some support equipment. We might need that. So we can integrate them. So be it. Now, we could probably win initially, but we're going to come all the way down here as fast as possible. Just go right there and have you guys go right to Asish. Asig. So see what happens. Get in there. Go, 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 go. And... You guys have to force the attack. We must win. And immediately begin attacking. Ah, uh, yes. Now these guys are going to go to war with us as well. We're going to lose a lot of guys in this battle, but so be it. Over here, we must do okay. I just want to circle and destroy these soldiers first. This little pocket got to be destroyed. Uh, see your height, Dienst. They only have one ally. We have actually quite a few allies. So that's actually really cool. This is why I got the Caucasian. Good. Let's go in now. Let's just go ahead and exterminate these Burgundians. Now they're attacking us. It's not going to be good. Whatever. It helps that they have no manpower left. And we have over 100,000. As, as we take more territory, we'll actually get more manpower in factories. So I'm not really too worried about it. But make sure we protect this area, though. Because this is the area we're going to be really focusing on. For you guys, Army 1... So you, you, and you all come to the tanks. Because we need you right there right now. They attack us. They're trying to beat us up. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. They're going to be... They've already lost over 100,000 soldiers. 150,000 soldiers. Alright, tank boys. Wow, we lost a lot of manpower already. But they're completely out, so... No matter. It'll be fine. Come on, move, move. Why are you taking so long? Immediately begin attacking. Force the attack. Force them down. Good. Good, 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 good. I can't hear anything else around here. Shen, so be it. We've lost 55,000. They lost almost 200,000 already, which is great. Come right here. As long as we use our tanks, we're going to get Magdeburg back immediately. Actually, no. Continue going to Leipzig. Leipzig is key. We get more strength. There you go. Come on, motorized. Get your butts in there right now. Increase infantry weapons. Very good. Got some more armor. We got Leipzig. Very good. Actually, you know what? I'm going to cut these guys off down here, too, first. We might have a rolling retreat up north, but it doesn't matter to me. Magdeburg, do not waste men. Oh, wait, no, wait. No, what? I clicked on this one, and it... Come on. 
It's fine. They're still attacking us like crazy, so... They've lost over a fifth of a million. A quarter million now, almost. Almost a quarter million. Head on down south. Force the attack. They are doomed. Alright. Soldiers. Actually, no. This is... They still have access through here, don't they? I thought this was... No, this is our land. So... Quickly. Move. They decrypted our ciphers. Oh, boy. Down there quickly. Good. Completely cut off. Completely cut off. Impressive. We are really running out of manpower now. Woof. Hey. Do we... We got some special forces, eh? Not bad. Oh, we got him. Good. At this point, we might be able to do it just a general attack. Look at that. Anyone have upgrades? No? Okay. Well, actually, Heinz here does. Adaptable? That's, I love adaptable. Actually, I really, really like adaptable. Alright. I believe it's time. Hangman's Requiem. God, don't let it be right. Hadra's thought. Maybe it wasn't too late. Maybe the maps were wrong. There could still be time, right? Time to move in and snatch those missiles before Hangman could act. Yep. No matter what disparate thoughts leaped to the forefront of his mind, he could not deny the facts that they were written on the map for him. Himmler had enough of the arsenal to launch a full-scale strike on the USA or Japan, and the moment they responded, Hadrian flung the map away and raised trembling hands to his face. No, 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 strike. Mata, Haida, Lina, he did, they didn't know. They weren't ready. How long would he have? Five, six, seven hours, maybe? Was that long enough to find anywhere safe? Maybe the Sudetenland or the Carpathians? Anywhere far enough away from major cities could have had a chance, surely. Throwing this door to his office open, he stood for a moment in the threshold, suddenly sweating profusely and shaking like a leaf. My Fuhrer, he asked the secretary. Are you unwell? Suddenly coming to life again, Hadrian strolled past his baffled secretary and the guards stood by the door. There was no hope left. He knew that in his heart. If it was it, the end of all things, then it would not be spent raging against the darkness and the heart of Germania. It would, if he was going to die as anything, it would be as a man. I'm coming home, Lena. So, okay, so. So we have this, and Hadrian obviously has just lost. But we're going to go right now back to an earlier save and make sure that we don't lose such a thing. Because we have seen this before in my first time playing as Hadrish. Alright everyone, and we're back! So, I made a mistake, obviously, as you can tell, because I didn't I didn't realize that we need that there was a garrison down here in Oberkommando Luftwaffe and Osterreich, mostly just, you know, the, their, their Luftwaffe down here, and it was taken over. So, that's obviously not very good. So, I've already begun attacking, it's now February 4th, and we're attacking the lines like crazy because, well, at this point, if we don't, we lose. So, if we don't win, well, everyone dies. As you can tell, obviously. Cutting down the garrison. Uh, we cannot afford to lose Regensburg. That is the key here to making sure that Himmler loses. So, my apologies about that. I totally forgot about that. When I practiced this off-screen, I actually did pretty darn well, I'd say. Pretty darn well. So, alright. Looks like the commandos uh been called in. All the commandos. Move in, move, 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 move. No peace, no, no, no time to wait. We're moving straight in. Uh, they still have six. They lost a lot of guys. Like they've really lost a lot of manpower. So all I had to do was just force the attack. It helps if they take over, you know, our lands, and then they suffer all sort of sorts of um attrition. But no manpower. Beautiful. Whew. So that's completely my fault. My apologies. I didn't even really realize that until like. It's too late, pretty much, so. Okay, doke. All eyes abroad. Eh, buy some more infantry equipment. We could probably use that. We can still try to integrate these guys, but I don't really see the point of that. Now, we probably lost over 150,000. Oh, well, we're not, not there yet, but that's fine. Oof. That's my fault. My fault completely. But <clears throat> I want to make sure I can still show you guys what happens when Hadrish does win, which is kind of a little different. A little different. Uh, you guys, make sure that we're all going at all times. That'd be very good. Even up here, get the ribbon. Which I thought we were up here. We were up here before, yeah, during the second, the first German Civil War. And now this is the second German. You can kind of think of it as a German Second Civil War. Maybe there's a third one too after this. You, know, you never know, especially, especially with what's happened so far in the world. We lost a division already. Oopsie. Whatever. It doesn't matter where we're headed. There you go. And as I said before, as long as we keep, you know, attacking and. Quite more territory, we get more manpower back. Great. Now, I'm still worried about these guys, but they're not in the war yet, so. More military factories, great. Oh, man, look at this. Wait, it's infantry. I thought it'd be, like, the tanks or stuff like that moving this quickly. But, okay. 
We're going to need Brussels because that'll be the second victory point capital, so. There you go. So many circumstances. So really, if you don't screw up like I did earlier, it's not that difficult. It's really not that bad. So. Come. Oh, we started quite early around here in the first German Civil War, so. Yeah. If you don't make simple mistakes like what I did, it's not too bad. This looks like a giant mess. They have less than 40 divisions. Good. They've lost 900,000 soldiers. And they should capitulate. Maybe soonish, actually. I'll go ahead and grab that. Doesn't matter. Go ahead and grab uh, this as well, because you can't. Oh, guys, uh, I'd recommend all Paris as well. That'd probably be sort of important. Well, we've killed almost a million of them. And a million more must go. Man, you guys really kind of suck, don't you? Maybe we're fighting over a river. Maybe that's it. There you go. All Paris is ours. Brussels is ours. Munich, huh? Strasbourg, they're still holding out here? How are they holding out? Are you guys doing anything? Like, just kill them. The last words. I told you it's not that bad. And you guys thought we would fail? I did earlier, for, and forgetting about Regensburg and the nukes there, but whatever. The last word. Heinrich Kilmer wasn't so impressed as Hadrius remembered him. Not with his split lip, uniform disheveled, or disheveled, and glasses missing. Beady eyes glared up from that pudgy face with hate tempered by the trembling of abject fear. Reinhard, Reinhard, what have you done? Came the quivering voice, weak and nasal. This <clears throat> betrayal is the end of us. Our undoing, it, stam it stammered and crackled like a nervous pu pubescent boy. The god of Zan will rule forever. The mongoloid face contorted in the throes of a mad ideological raving, cornered and in denial of its fate. Your wife, your daughters will be whores, breeding souls for... Hadrian's fists lashed out to interrupt the Reichsfeer's venomous words before they could sully his ears further. He filled his rage boiling over for the first time in years, washing away all... all Inhibition, in a raid wave. What fool, he simply asked. You brought us to this point, he Heinrich. Heinrich, you made the Reich what it is. You halted our mission. We had the world in our grasp, and you stole it away. He struck Himmler again, eliciting a flow of blood from his nostrils. Himmler's eyes bulged in deranged fury. It was your fault, you. If you just followed orders, but you wouldn't, would you? White Moses, you... They were right to call you that. A Jew in human skin, that's all you ever were. The arch-infiltrator, Zionist's youngest elder, the cane of an entire civilization who jerked and thrashed within his restraints. Spittle flying from his bloodied lips with every hateful word. Hadrius had come for answers, but whatever was left of the Reich's fears, the range miles far too gone to give them. No, Himmler, you destroyed our vision. You betrayed Hitler and our people. I've corrected the order of things, and now it will be as it always should have been. I only did what I ever had to do, Himmler screamed. Hadrius unbuckled his holster and drew forth the sleek, black luger, always at his side, and thumbed up the safety off. As... Did I? Um, uh, I'm not really sure if there's anything to be heard, but we can still do. Oh, we look pretty good. If you want to read about the the, the grow gambit, go right ahead. But I don't think it really matters too much. Oh, resolution. Cool. It was done. They just almost couldn't believe it. The invincible shadow state laid low by coalition of the willing. It had been them, or he who had led them to victory. He, Brynal Hadrish, the Butcher of Prague, the Blonde Beast, the Man of the Iron Heart, whom nobody ever expected to rule, yet rule he did from Ospir to Galicia, from Schleswig Holstein to the Alps, it was his. That is what they claimed in the taverns and SS barracks across the Reich. And it was what the new map in his office affirmed. But he knew it wasn't so. Loyalty was a dead concept. Nobody who had served in his coalition was loyal to him personally as they would have been to Hitler. Nobody really wanted him to rule, even after defeating Himmler. Those who had the decency to serve the Reich rather than themselves were dead or scattered to the winds by his hands, thanks to his past servitude to Himmler. He thought of Speer and the paternal love Hitler had borne for him. A bowman of his mastery of politics, of goring in his unwavering popularity, he could not command anything so useful or admirable. Hitler had liked him for his ruthlessness, but it was that very trait which had led him to into Himmler's clutches. If he just picked his side earlier, sparing himself and the Reich all those years of disgrace and turmoil, yes, it all came down to him, his indecision, his weakness, his mistakes, and now all the good left in him had been forsaken in the name of destroying Himmler, loyalty, honor, principle, all sacrificed on the altar of victory. He could only stare out across the building, or the rebuilding cityscape of Germania as hope and pride continued to drain from his soul, pouring out into the night sky. He was empty. So empty. The Maidens. Silke and Marti had never been inside the Führer's office, not even when Hadrich brought them to the Berlin and his children. Hitler had only been ever met briefly at Berchtesgaden, and once at their estate after Klaus died. Now, there they sat, daughters of the Führer. The most powerful man on earth, yet had been a disappointing trip, always distant yet overbearing. Now their father wanted to see them? He hadn't been so interested when they needed his investment the most. Silke, Marta, he said, breaking several minutes of silence. He was uncharacteristically soft-spoken all of a sudden. I... 
I know that the circumstances of the initiative have not always permitted it, but I hope that you are both aware how much I care for both of you. Now that the traitors are defeated, you can look forward to rich and happy lives. Yes, Father, muttered uh, Mart Armati, deferential as ever. Silky was thus so. We have rich and happy lives already. No thanks to you. We've grown women, and we're not little girls. Don't talk to us like that, if you please. For a moment, I looked as though Hadrish might rise from his desk and say something vicious. But instead of said, his shoulders just slumped. For a moment, he looked slightly confused, or perhaps sad. It's hard to tell, but it was certainly an expression his daughters couldn't remember seeing on their father's face at any point. Sorry, he finally said. He finally mumbled. He looked away out of the mu out of the window. I'm sure you understand how parents must think now as to the future. When are you going to do something about our gosh darn rights? Demanded Silky. She bears a lot to her right. Maybe Ada Goring is happy with servitude, but we're not. Ada just frowned. You know those ideals are not permissible. Speaking as your father and fear both, I must maintain the deal of... Silky stood up without a word and departed before he could finish. With an apologetic glance, Smutty followed, leaving Hadrish alone in the office once more. Where did I go wrong? And the inheritor. Hadrish heard someone pick up the receiver on the other end of the line at long last. It had been too long since he had spoken to Heidi. Uh, or Hyde. A mistake he would now rectify. As a son and heir, it was only right that Hyde was beginning to assume both honors and burdens befitting his status like Josiah's son, look, Vitikand. Vitikand. Now there was a fine example, a little politically disengaged perhaps, but an admirable young Aryan nonetheless. Hadrish, residence, came a weary voice from the receiver. Hi, my boy. Hadrish put on his fa best fatherly eyes. Good morning. Click. No hesitation. Dejected. Hadrish dropped the receiver back onto its hook, resisting the sudden urge to fling it against the wall. Stupid boy, stubborn as ever, still clinging to the ideals his father had fought so hard to extinguish in the Civil War. Maybe a sturm in the... <clears throat> he thought his thoughts froze midway through formation. What was he thinking? Heidi was his blood, his progeny. Blood was what mattered above all. It defined race, nation, and heritage. What without ties of blood, what more was there? But still, Haid was his child, deserving of discipline. So what if he resented his father? He had to learn, like any other recalcitrant citizen. That was the ideal which Himmler... No. Himmler's ideals? Not his. Not Germany's. Himmler's. Words and thoughts of a traitor. An uncomfortable thought began to dawn on Hadrish as a cold sensation spread down his spine. No. 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 I was hoping for the next event there. We already 311 political power, not bad. And the Republic of Ireland owns all of Ireland. The better half. Lena's hair was graying like her husband's. But still, he remained enraptured by her beauty. They reclined together on a couch in the Fear's private lounge in the Reich's Chancellery, quietly conversing as the sun set on Germania. It doesn't feel, you know, it doesn't feel right, Lena murmured, looking up at Heydrich from her place in his arms. All this chaos is finally over. We finally had the good old days back, Reinhardt. Hmm. Hadris just continued to stare over her out the window. Reinhardt, are you listening? He shook himself out of his, his reverie and looked down into his wife's eyes. Slightly dazed. Sorry, Lena, I was, well, yeah, you're right. It doesn't feel real. I never thought it would end how it did, having to fight my brothers in another gosh darn war. And now you can make Germany into what it should be, she replied with a smile. All those ideas you've been dwelling on, trying to get people to listen for years. You can make them the law now. You could do anything you wanted. No more of that pig, Mott, and Bowman steering things off the roads, hmm? I'll miss our servants, though. Slaves, he corrected them. Yes, whatever you call them. It was so convenient, especially the ones we got rid of the Jews and the Jeho Jehovah Witnesses instead. And, or took those people instead. I felt so much safer with them around. Never would have liked our boys growing up around those dark-eyed vermin. Hadrish had thoughts, many thoughts, but kept them to himself. No sense in bothering Lena with uncertainties now. Let her enjoy the comfort of a self-assured life. She would need the memories of come darker days, glancing down at her relaxed face, soft features concealing venom and silky and honey-like. He ran his fingers through her graying hair and whispered gently, I love you, Lena. The Lost. Klaus Hedrich. Wow. 1933 to 43. Beloved son of Einhard and Lena Hedrich, brother of Silke, Heide, and Mata Hedrich. Rest in peace. Klaus hadn't died because of the Jews, Hedrich thought as he knelt before his son's grave. The gold drizzled, slowly dampening his SS uniform. He hadn't died because of Bolshevism. He had died because he was a child who didn't understand safety. He died because he rode his bicycle onto the road too quickly for the truck driver, a German, Aryan truck driver, to stop in time. At the time, Hedrich had still been the Reich's protector, working overtime in Prague to make sure there was nothing left of the Czech resistance. What if he'd been there? It seemed to him that the first and foremost duty of the Aryan man was to protect his family, at least. That was what the most important traditional value surely was. One bloodline was the basis of race and continuation, wasn't it? Instead, he'd been far away, enforcing Himmler's orders by ensuring the total destruction of the Czech national consciousness. Was that the right thing to do at the time? He hadn't really thought about it. In hindsight, that would depend on how compromised Himmler's vision had been. If he'd been loyal or disloyal to Hitler, even then. He just shivered and drew out his coat tighter on himself. The thought wasn't bearable. Pushing aside, he tried his best to think only of a son, and then ten happy years he'd been able to give him. He did not succeed. Questions. The list Hadrish had requested sat at the desk in a neat stack. The size alone had been enough for him to never, ever even bother looking at them. It was enough of an answer to his own question. Too many 
What was the answer? Too many dead Germans, dead Aryans, dead by his order, men, women, children, his enemies, and the families like the Jews hadn't done that he had. The question had been answered, but at this rate, at which his own people slaughtered each other, had only increased. What did it imply? Hadrius didn't want to know, but there was no escaping it. Empirically, much of what was certain in the world was certain no longer. Two of the most devastating conflicts in Germany's history had been caused by Aryan hands, Aryan minds, and Aryan politi politicking. The fear suddenly shot upright as thought electrified. No, 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 no. That would be the end of it. The end of it at all. Nothing would matter any more of that. Everything would have been tried and failed. If it was an error, no. Not an error. Not a mistake. A lie. The future. What's next? Hadrius was silent for a long moment. I'm not certain, Gil. As he replied, the situation is tenuous. Victory's euphoria will burn out soon enough. Beyond that... Gila chuckled from wherever he was speaking. Hadrius could hear cheering and an SS song being roared on in the background. Beyond that, my Fero, we shall do what we must as we always have. What, one more civil war. All that's good for cause in the end. If this last war wasn't enough to cow the traitors once and for all, we can try again. It's never failed us before. Hasn't it? Hadrius' voice took on a bitter tone. Wouldn't it have been better if the Aryans didn't shoot each other's blood twice over already if he just... Just what, my Fuhrer? asked Gilem, with an unpleasant chill to his voice. Just talked? That was never going to happen. Blood and iron, that is our way. The destiny of the German race is forged in the fires of war and nowhere else. Whether it takes one war or a thousand will never change, God willing. Hadrius couldn't muster another response. Blood and iron. That was right, wasn't it? The last empire hadn't been crafted by a diplomat, but by soldiers and their emperor. Four years of glory, he of, over of hegemony over the Central Europe, and then it had come crashing down. Yet, then again, was Hitler's Reich. What was Hadrius' Reich? Was that too doomed to a mere decades of existence before another bloody twilight fell upon it? He dropped the phone and slumped back into his chair, ignoring Gila's tinny voice coming from the dangling receiver. And what, if this is what it was all for, then I fear for the future. Oblivion. For the first time in a long time, Hadrius was drunk. He'd finally opened the cognac set as a gift by some ignoramus in the Waffen SS, unaware of the fear's standard, and had him put the bottle down in six hours. Lena, he had slurred, slumped over his desk. Lena, Lena, I've made so many, my God, just... Throwing himself back into his chair, he raised the bottle and guzzled down another mouthful, ignoring the alcohol that dribbled down his collar and onto his unkempt uniform. As it finally ran empty, he let it drop to the floor where he clinked loudly on the tiles before running out of sight. Ah, Himmler. Hmm. There was a moment's pause, then a sudden turmoil within him. Hadrush had about two seconds' notice before he vomited loudly and painfully, doubling over and splattering bile and alcohol over his desk and the floor and his trousers. He slumped back, too exhausted and apathetic to do anything about it. He passed out thinking of what could have been, of the naval life, or life in the Luftwaffe, of a world where he rejected Lena's notion of working for a new upstart political party, or peaceful retirement that he could have taken years ago, or for a better world that might have come if he just shot Himmler for the coup attempt over a decade ago. When he woke, he was it was from a distorted torrent of nightmares and could have been. He dragged himself to the bathroom and stand, just filthy and shameful, before mirroring. Staring back, he saw Reinhard Hedrich for what he truly was, the last traitor. Oh no. Epitaph. Dearest Lena, by the time you're reading this, it's come clear to you that the Reich you knew is no more. The very tenets of national so socialism, which upon our nations both, have failed us. There's only one more barrier preventing this truth from becoming known to all, and I intend to remove it. It will not be an easy thing for you to bear, but I implore you to forge ahead regardless of how difficult life becomes. Our children will stand with you, or of this I am certain. Now that all else, all else is uncertain, family is all we have left. Our arrangements were made in the past for an occasion such as this, though... The exact circumstances that led to it were not something I could have foreseen. No matter what happens, you and our, our children will be safe. I swear on what little remains of my honor. Do not want for money, security, or sustenance. Ensure that our children receive this message. I especially wish for you to pass my unconditional love to Hyde, whom I, who have, whom I have failed more profoundly than any other, and to think of always of Klaus taken from us because I was not there protect, to protect him. There's one more thing which I express here to you alone. Himmler was not the true last traitor. I am. Himmler betrayed us all and would have damned the world to hell of nuclear Armageddon, but my betrayal runs far deeper. For, by the waging of civil war upon fellow Germans, I have exposed the futility and failures of all that Hitler has built. Had I chosen ignorance, I might have avoided this, but I could not do so. All I ever wanted was to serve faithfully, but that which I was loyal to is a house of mirrors built upon sand. Tell the children that I love them, that their father died doing the right thing, and now forevermore, Lena, I love you. Hadrius set his pen aside, ex exhaled slowly as his hand moved and the Polish, the polished Luger before him. There's only one more mistake to correct, and then the gods, too, will come to an end. I'll feed us them. Now, is he still intoxicated now? I'm, I'm pretty sure even if he wasn't intoxicated, he probably would still do this. But, I don't know. I mean, he does have a redeeming arc, and the storytelling is pretty good for this, but... I don't know. I don't know. And, it's over. He ends it, He ends the last trader, and let's take a look at what we have. So we have Deutsches Reich. Led by Speidel, who might get content later on in the future. We don't know. And we have the Gross Germanisches Reich, led by Gila. So basically, him and Gila are killing each other. While, well, Nueva Etat, France, led by Christian de la Mazière, is currently fighting the French state of all things. And they're ultra nationalists versus fascists. But that's pretty much the end of uh, the game. These guys don't have unique focus trees. Uh, Deutsches Reich is not Gross Germanisches Reich. Uh, 
these guys, I was not expecting these guys at all. So, and of course, French State did have a focus tree, I think, but whatever. But that's pretty much it. I do apologize for my mistake earlier. I should have realized that Regensburg would be lost and I needed to race down there in time. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed Hadrish for the second time on the channel. I, I love playing as Hadrish. It's a lot of fun, but regardless, I'm going to play similar sometime in other German uh, leaders. But like I said, I hope you enjoyed the campaign. If you did, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I will see you tomorrow in a different campaign. Thanks for watching. And have a great, great rest of your day.